You're listening to Plug In to Health with Prevea Health, exploring healthcare topics that matter to you, the latest developments in health and medicine, and the inspiring stories that emerge from Prevea Health, our partners, and the communities we serve. On this episode of the Great Doctors Inspiring Stories series, we're going on a journey with Dr. Beth Woods, a pediatric cardiologist at Prevea Health in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Dr. Woods' journey is going to take us to a lot of places, from Alaska to military bases, world championship taekwondo competitions, and more. We're thrilled to have her. Dr. Woods, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. First, a bit about what it is you do here at Prevea, what kind of care you provide as a pediatric cardiologist. Yeah, so I take care of kids up to about 18 years of old, or 18 years of age um, who are born with heart defects or have other issues with the cardiovascular system in that age range. So I do a lot of chest pain. I do a lot of fainting, uh, the kids who get lightheaded. Um, a lot of that turns out not to be cardiac in origin or, or pathologically cardiac in origin, but my job is to discern that and to let the patients and their treating providers know that uh, either it's a kind of a normal part of growing up or it sh- they should look to another organ system if it's not the heart. And if it is the heart, it's my job to treat it and uh, help the patients live their best lives. And what does treatment look like today for pediatric heart conditions? Well, it certainly depends on the condition. Um, I would say overall, and one of the reasons I love pediatric cardiology is um, it looks hopeful and promising and um, positive generally. I mean, even our our most severe heart defects, uh, we treat. Um, Most of them we can essentially cure. Um, Others we can uh, get as close to normal as possible, but those kids can leave, lead very normal lives, active lives. You know, gone are the days when the heart kids were fragile, mm-hmm. um, when they didn't play sports and sat on the sidelines. You know, our goal is uh, not only to treat the heart disease, but to make sure that that kid feels as normal as every other kid in their class. Mm-hmm. What do you love most about your job? I like the people. Mm. I love the people. Um, I like the families. I like the kids. I like that I get to follow them and watch them grow and, uh, you know, start out when they're babies and then ask them where they're going to go to college and what they're going to do with their lives um, and kind of just follow them through that whole journey. I love the parents. I can relate to them in a lot of ways. I have teenagers now. So, um, you know, it's almost like uh, the kid will come in and we'll spend 10 minutes of the, you know, hour-long appointment just catching up with the parents and seeing where they are. Um, I love who I work with. I have an amazing staff. I work with great pediatricians, and I work in a great community. I mean, it's just all around. I just love it. But it's the people that make it. I was watching on Prevea.com for each of our physicians, we have what are called bio videos. Mm-hmm. You can click on a video and learn a little bit about each each physician. And I, I watched yours today. And something that you had said that really um, hit home for me as a parent, you said something along the lines of always wanting to make sure that families feel like you've given they have all the information they need. And you it's like a question you always ask them is, are you going to be able to sleep tonight? Yes. Do, have I given you everything that you need? And I just think that says so much um, about you as a physician. Well, not only giving the information, but that they've been heard yeah. is huge for me too. Um, I mean, I've had the experience of going into a physician's office and walking out and thinking, ah, you know, th- that doctor didn't get what I'm really here for, what I need. And maybe that's on me for not communicating it, but I don't want people to walk out of my office and feel like they weren't heard, feel like... Um, you know, I'll ask the teenagers, does, does that make sense to you? Are you, you know, because a lot of the times I am telling them, you're okay. Yes, you get lightheaded when you stand up, but here's why. Here's the physiology behind it. Here's the things you can do to help it, but it may not go away completely. But it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your heart or your cardiovascular system. Um, and I always ask them, does that make sense to you? Because I can say that, but if they don't buy into it, then they're still going to be worried that no, she missed something. Mm-hmm. It's not so. Rather than just saying this is normal, this is what your body does, explaining to them the physiology um, and the reasons it does it, I feel like helps them to feel at ease sure. and to realize that yeah, this is okay. 
So not only are you a great doctor, um, you also have some inspiring stories, fun stories to kind of share. Um, and that's that's another reason why we wanted to, to bring you here on here as part of the series. So let's kind of go on that journey that we talked about. And for you, it starts in Alaska mm-hmm. because it's where you were born. Mm-hmm. What can you share with us about what it was like to grow up in Alaska? Yeah, I mean, as an adult, I look back and I think, wow, that was extraordinary. Um, of course, at the time, I just, that's that was just life. I didn't realize it was different. Um, some of my earliest memories are, relate to the, the daylight and nighttime phenomena that we have in Alaska, particularly northern Alaska, where, more northern where I lived. So we get a... Uh, pretty much 24 hours of daylight in the winter. Uh, you might get a, an hour or two of some twilight, but you're at school. Um, and then we get 24 hours of daylight in the summer where 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. look exactly the same. So I have lots of memories of, you know, just being, I can think of one time we were at the park and I was playing with friends. My mom drove up and saying, you know, where have you been? You need to come home. And I couldn't understand why she was so upset. And it was like the middle of the night. Oh <laughs> it was probably God. 2 o'clock in the morning. And we didn't know because... We didn't it have was phones back then, you know. It was daylight. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So there's no like come home when the streetlights come on because the streetlights don't come on in the summertime. Right. And on the other side, in the wintertime, it's dark all the time. Um, you know, I can remember taking trips in the wintertime sometimes to either Michigan or California, where my my parents were from, and thinking, wow, it's really neat to have sun in the morning because um, it is hard to get up when it's dark, but mm-hmm. it is dark. Um, but again, it's just it's what I grew up with, so I didn't really know. My dad is a, or was a bush pilot, so many times, you know, he'd, I'd come home from school, he'd come home from work, he'd say, you want to go fishing? I'd say, sure, and we'd drive to the airport, we'd hop in his Super Cub, and uh, if it was wintertime, he'd be on skis, and we'd land on skis on the lake, in the summertime, he'd be on floats, and we'd land on floats and just fish from the airplane, and then, you know, fill a bag with fish and head home. Um, one fun story, when we were ice fishing uh, on a little lake in Alaska, and we were catching pike, which are you call northerns. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we caught a whole bunch of the huge northerns, or pike, and put them in a big hefty ziplo- or hefty bag, hefty garbage bag, and put it in the snow so they froze. And then we threw them in the back of the airplane. We flew home, so a few hours later, and it was my job to clean the fish when we got home. Mm-hmm. So I had them on the counter, and I remember one of their tails flopped. And this, these things had been out of the water for hours. And I called my brother over, Jason, look. And he said, let's put him in the bathtub. <laughs> so we did. And all of these pike came back to life. Oh, the funny my part is we only had one bathroom. They came back to life. Okay. They did. They all came back to life. So we had pike floating in our bathtub. I don't remember. Your doctor skills bathtub. were at work. Absolutely. I revived them. <laughs> so I don't remember how that worked out. I do remember my mom being upset that they were pike in the bathtub. <laughs> But I don't remember how they, how long we kept them there. But, um, um, but that was, you know, growing up in Alaska. I remember flying with my dad and saying, "Oh, hitting his shoulder, saying moose, moose," and mm. he would land, and we'd, you know, set up tent and hunt the moose. It was always my job to carry the, the liver, the tongue, um, and the heart. Those wow. are my organs, and I, because I was little, you know, yeah. But I could, I could carry those. Um, yeah. So it, and it didn't didn't seem unusual to me at all. Do you hunt or fish or anything today? I enjoy fishing. Um, I would hunt if I had to, but I have lots of people around me who want to hunt. Um, So no, I mean, I hunted with my dad growing up. It's not a passion of mine by any means. I have no problem with it because I really like eating. Um, But, but no, I, yeah, it's it's not something I care to Mm -hmm. go sit out in the woods and do. (laughs) But I love fishing. At taekwondo mm-hmm. was a huge passion and that's giant passion that is another really cool part of your story bring us through that journey that starts at six years old yeah I was young um so my brother and sister both were hockey players and I grew up at the hockey rink and uh you know sometimes you're lucky enough to have indoor games but a lot of times we had outdoor games and you know Fairbanks will get to 50 below easily and we average about 20 below all winter long so I just remember being cold and I did not want to play hockey so um I don't remember how I got interested. I, I just, I think at a young age, I started asking to join karate, uh, the only martial art that I knew of. And my sister's friend's dad was in taekwondo. And so my mom put me in. And I can remember every year she would pay by the year because it was cheaper if you paid up front. So she never pressured me by any means, but she would just say, all right, if you want to do it another year, we're going to do it for a year. So make your decision. And every year I'd say, uh, 
okay, one more year, you know. And then at some point, I um, I just really got hooked. And uh, I think when I started competing and feeling that thrill of competition, I, I do have a little bit of a competitive spirit, and uh, started winning and enjoying that. And uh, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I – one of the things you you had told me to think about is what are my memories. A lot of my memories of Alaska are actually at the gym, um, working out and training and teaching and competing. Um, so that was a huge part of my life, huge part. And that became like a second family. Yeah, but um, you really, when you say competing, I mean, we're talking gold medals, world championships. Um, you were in boys and men's competitions as well. So coming up, I was. I, I was always in the boys' competition. There was no women's competition or girls' competition. That was in Alaska ah, when I was yeah. coming up. Now okay. there is. Now there's sure. definitely women's divisions. Um, but no, when I was, uh, you know, up until even high school in Alaska, um, especially if it was in my hometown and not in Anchorage, which is the bigger city, I would compete in the first the boys' division and then the men's divisions because that's what we had. Um, and, yeah, and I, I did well. I thought I, I – you know, you, you don't know how, how you are really until you get out on a bigger stage. But my first national competition that I went to, I took four medals, all four golds. Um, and that was all in women's competitions because nationally you have a women's division, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I think training with the men and, and, and you know, kind of getting that aggressive spirit mm-hmm. um, helped. My instructor was amazing. I credit him with a great deal of my – just my life, my uh, – attitude all of that so um yeah no turned out I was pretty good when I got out nationally and I didn't really know (laughs) but then I did end up uh so uh I don't know it was third or fourth national competition that I went to then was a qualifier for the world championships uh in Kuala Terengganu Malaysia so I went with the U.S. team to Malaysia and yeah the rest is history it was it was great I got uh two bronze, a silver, and a gold at the World Championships. That is incredible. And so you actually have a fourth-degree black belt. Yeah, I actually tested for fourth degree during medical school. So that was... uh That was hard. (laughs) Yeah. To to find the time to train and and all that kind of stuff. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you do... Do you practice at all today, Taekwondo? So not not in the last... uh, It's been probably over a year, I started having some back issues and actually had a spinal fusion surgery less than a year ago. Mm. So I'm still working through that and all that kind of stuff. But it feels like a, a missing part. You know, I can't wait to get back into the gym and and yeah, just get back to it. Because um, it's fun. I mean, and again, just like my work, it's the people that, that make everything right. So mm-hmm. I miss the people I miss um, the camaraderie, I miss the competition. Yeah, all of it. When did the interest in medicine start? So I really didn't have medicine on my radar. Um, And I think that's because I didn't know any female physicians growing up. And of course, I was in Fairbanks, Alaska, so little little community there. In retrospect, there were female physicians. I just didn't know any. I think there were quite a a lot less than the male physicians for sure. But it just didn't even occur to me that that's something I could do. I mean, physicians are these really amazing people and I'm just Mm -hmm. I'm just me um so I started college uh thinking I was going to be a child psychologist I wanted to work with children I knew that and uh, I just wanted to help people and I thought that was a good way I learned pretty quick that I'm not a gray thinker I'm very much a black and white thinker and I just I could not wrap my head around all the theories in psychology I wanted I wanted answers, not theories. So I gravitated pretty quickly in college to the math and the science, and I loved math and science. Um, and then it was like, what am I going to do with math and science? Um, I did some genetics work and realized pretty quick I don't want to be in a lab. I want to work with people. And then I met my, who would eventually be my husband and now ex-husband, <laughs> and his mother, who happens to be an obstetrician. So she's a physician. Oh. And I can remember in that first meeting sitting down with her and just thinking, wow, there's nothing special about her. Like, in, in a good way, not in a, you know, she is a normal person. Like, she's speaking to me, like, just normal. You know, <laughs> she's not a superstar. She's not, you know, someone that I just can't even relate to. And um, pretty much right there, I was like, well, heck, I can do this. So I decided I was going to go to medical school. And um, I can remember walking across campus at University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I went to undergrad. 
uh, with my genetics professor, actually, and he, it was in my, coming up on my senior year, and he said, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, well, I'm going to go to medical school. And I remember he looked at me kind of funny, and he said, oh, you're going to go to medical school. And I said, yeah, why? Like, I didn't understand what he was saying. And he said, well, most people say, I'm hoping to go to medical school, or I'm applying to medical school. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't have a plan B. <laughs> it didn't occur to me that I wouldn't get in. I think that goes back to martial arts, too. You just, you train for it you prepare for it and then you know everything falls into place and i just mm -hmm. assumed in retrospect that was naive um but i did get into medical school thankfully so uh, the rest is history so i guess <laughs> it was okay but um it didn't even occur to me that i wouldn't get into medical school at the time yeah and and, and you did and and so then bring us through that that education training and work um you did to to be here where you are yeah. today so, um, like I said, I went to undergrad at University of Alaska Fairbanks. I majored in um, chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry and molecular biology. And then went to uh, medical school in Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Oregon Health Sciences University. To pay for medical school, I joined the military, which is where that works in. Um, so I first joined the Navy, who paid for medical school, and then I went to residency with the Navy in San Diego, at Naval Medical Center San Diego. And they have a partnership with Rady Children's Hospital um, for their training. So I trained at Rady's and, uh, and um, Naval Medical Center San Diego. So that was four years in Portland and then three years in San Diego. When I finished my residency, the Navy um, had, it was during an era when all of the branches were trying to cut back on spending. And the Navy had decided to cut back on their active duty medical personnel. Mm -hmm. And they actually did that by close to 40%. And how they decided to do that was if a billet, which is a job in the, in the military, opened up, they just weren't filling it, and they would fill that with a civilian contractor. Well, I was looking for a job after residency. <laughs> sure. And so there weren't any jobs. Um, so they told us we had options. We could, uh, we could do, I could do flight or dive medicine, which sounded amazing, but I am terribly claustrophobic, and there was just no way. Um, or I could look to public health, or I could see if any of the other branches would take me, which is very unusual to, to switch branches, but it's not unheard of. Just so happened, my hometown right outside is Isleson Air Force Base, about 30 miles outside, and it's not a popular base because it's in the cold part of Alaska. Mm. If you can, yeah. <laughs> there's a cold part and a warm part. <laughs> Everyone wants to go to Elmendorf, which is in Anchorage, and that's a bigger city and um, on the coast and things like that. But Fairbanks, they tend to have a hard time filling. And so I called the commander up there and I said, hey, I'm from Fairbanks and I would like to come. And he, I remember him trying to talk me out of it and saying, you know, it's really cold here. And I said, yes, I do. Like what kind of cold are <laughs> I, we talking? I, um, so it usually snows. Um, it'll oftentimes snow in August. September's the latest I've ever seen it snow. But when it snows, it snows on the ground. Like mm -hmm. it's not like here where snow melts because it doesn't go above freezing after that. Um, and then the snow is on the ground until into May. And when I say it doesn't go above freezing, it usually doesn't go above zero. I mean, we're pretty much below zero all winter. Our average temperature is about minus 20. And there are plenty of times that you see minus 50, minus 60. In fact, when I was after residency, I did do that inner service transfer. And so I ended up in the Air Force. And I ended up at Isleson Air Force Base, Alaska. I lived off base. And the base policy was if you lived off base and the temperature was colder than minus 40 Fahrenheit. Mm. I'm sorry, minus 50 Fahrenheit, <laughs> not 40. Minus 50 Fahrenheit, you did not have to drive onto base. You could just stay home because it's dangerous to drive yeah. in minus 50. Cars tend not to run, and if you're out in it for, you know, more than a moment, you can have permanent damage. So every morning I would – of course, we didn't have cell phones then. I would call time and temperature because <laughs> that was the official yes. uh, at the airport. And, you know, if they said minus 49, you could just hear me go, oh, are you kidding me? But minus 51 <laughs> was fantastic. I had the day off. Yeah. And then after a while, the commander was threatening to make all medical personnel live on base because so many of us weren't coming in <laughs> when it was minus 50. So that's how cold it gets. Yeah, um, wow. it's, it's brutally cold. Mm -hmm. And I, having grown up there and lived there forever, it just was what it was. When I came back after living four years in Portland and three years in San Diego, I came back and I, went, I didn't remember it being this cold. It was brutally cold yeah, yeah. So, so what was it what was it like you know practicing medicine on in in the military core, yeah. any core memories from those days from the military you know it's always the people 
mm-hmm. like I said. Um, my core military memories are more about my training. Mm-hmm. Um, if if I take aside the people, because it's always about the patients. I, I have specific patients that I will never forget. A lot of them I'm still in touch with and in touch with their family. Thanks to social media, it's great. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can see what they're up to on Facebook. It's awesome. Um, but military specifically, my training, I went to officer indoctrination school. Uh, you get one summer off in medical school between your first and second year, and then otherwise you work through the last three years. So that summer I went to officer indoctrination school in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, because here I am a military officer. I knew nothing about the military. I had no military family. So at officer indoctrination school, you learn how to wear the uniform, what the uniform means, all of the insignia for, uh, you know, both enlisted and officers, um, the history of the military, the traditions of the military. It's, I mean, it was fascinating. And I love, I, I, I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning. I think that's probably true of most people who spend as much time in school as I do or have. Um, and I just thought it was incredible. And going through that process, getting my uniform, wearing my uniform for the first time, just felt like I was part of something so important and so much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say even more so than medicine and medical school and all that kind of stuff. The the military was just this, uh, the the lift that it gave me to be a part of that Mm -hmm. was incredible. So that, and then I went to, in medical school, uh, I went to a course called C4, which is Combat Care Casualty Course, where we, I mean, we just, even growing up in Alaska, even hunting and fishing with my dad, even, you know, landing on remote lakes and digging a tent out from under a bush and putting up a stuff, this was so far beyond even that kind of roughing it and and outdoor stuff. So we were, I mean, we were intense. We were, uh, you know, finding our way around by compass and maps. Thank God we had corpsmen with us, which corpsmen are like um, medics, basically, for the Navy, but so much more. They're medics on steroids um, because they're also incredible soldiers. And these guys, you know, we'd be horribly lost, and they would be feeding us hints <laughs> to try to find our way where we're supposed to be going. Um, they were just incredible. And survival skills, repelling. We did the gas chamber um, in uh, in my OIS. We did firefighter training. Um, just all this cool stuff that, as a civilian, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had – it wouldn't even been on my radar. I wouldn't have had any idea that it – I mean, I knew it existed, but that I could have done it. Um, so that, that was incredible. I, I wish everybody could do that because it's just, it's a great experience. It's just crazy to think of, um, how much that has had to have helped make you an amazing doctor today. Yes. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) Right? I mean, it certainly made me who I am. Um, I think, uh, Certainly working with military families and working within the military system um, and then going to the civilian system, which is so different. I'm glad that I've experienced them both and I can draw from those experiences um, in terms of navigating <laughs> the systems. Um, I think the the various people that I've had the the pleasure and, and um, the ability to work with has made me more empathetic toward everyone. Um, and yeah, I think all of my life experience have just gone into how I practice and mm-hmm. just how I approach people in general. Then where did the interest come into the pediatric cardiology specialty? Yeah, so um, somewhere in medical school, I can tell you where. Uh, at first I thought I wanted to do OB, and I did OB and I found it it was. I, I thought I was going to love it, and I didn't. And I found what I loved about it. In fact, <laughs> one of my evaluations that I saved in medical school was my OB evaluation. And I never had any negative evaluations. For the most part, they were all very good because I tried hard. Um, but this one said, it started out by saying, Beth is a team player, and she, you know, all these nice things. And she said, it said, sometimes she seems more interested in the babies than the moms. <laughs> and I thought... <laughs> That is accurate. <laughs> that is perfectly accurate. I remember we had twins, and they took the babies away. And I was like, they, I think she said to me, do you want to sew? Like, I get to do sewing, which for a medical student, you're like, that's a big deal to go mm-hmm. sew. And I was like, no, I really want to go with the twins. <laughs> so 
Um, that was accurate. The babies have always appealed to me. The children have always appealed to me. So I thought um, pediatrics. Um, I always thought that I wanted to specialize only because, again, I'm a, I'm a black and white thinker. And I like answers. And I feel I felt like as a specialist, I would just be more comfortable with the answers, if that makes sense. Be able to narrow down to, to know a lot about one thing. Um, so I thought that I was going to do neonatology, which is taking care of newborns, premature and, and, and term newborns, um, basically while they're still in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So in a NICU usually setting. Usually in a neonatal intensive care unit setting. Yep. Um, and so my first rotation in fellowship was NICU, knowing that I wanted to do that. What I found I really liked in the NICU was when we had a baby with a questionable cardiac defect and we would call the cardiologist and he would come rolling in his machine and he'd put that probe on the baby's chest and he would let everybody know what was going on and then we knew what to do and, you know, and I just thought that is awesome. Uh, And I find the heart itself as an organ, as a system, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of like that it's a little bit scary. You know, there's a little bit of drama to it because it's... You know, things can go from looking great to really not great just at the drop of a hat, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that appeals to me, the little bit of, I don't know, drama involved, I guess. Sure. Um, but that's so pretty quickly in residency, I decided I wanted to be a cardiologist. And of course, um, again, it all comes back to people. I trained with two really great cardiologists who um, I just really enjoyed them as people. Mm-hmm. And so that influenced me as well. Um So pretty quick, I knew I wanted to be a cardiologist. I had this payback time to the military. I didn't want to owe more time to the military because I didn't didn't think that I was going to make it a career, and I didn't. Um, So if if I did fellowship while I was still active duty military, then I would owe time, extra years of time. So I decided I would do pediatrics, general pediatrics, pay back the military, and then go to fellowship. And it's the best decision I ever made. I feel like, um, again, the things that make me the physician that I am, I would absolutely not be the physician that I am had I not been a general pediatrician. Mm. And I did that for a little over six years. And uh, where was that? So that brought me back. uh, I did the inter-service transfer to Alaska. Yeah. So at Ileson Air Force Base, I was the only pediatrician on the base. Um, And that's interesting coming right out of residency because, you know, you learn a lot in residency, but I think the last or the first three years or so of actually being a physician is really where you learn how to be really be a physician you know they lay the the blocks in residency but but really to get comfortable you need this time and usually you'll come out of residency and you'll work with a doctor who will mentor you who you can ask questions of (laughs) and here i was in the middle of alaska (laughs) by myself wow so i worked with family practitioners but they were looking to me um because i was more specialized in that area so that was nerve-wracking, and that was a very fast learning curve. Um, I did my payback with military, and then, again, kind of this circle back moment, I had worked as a receptionist in the clinic where I received care as a child, um, and, of course, the hospital where I was born. Um, I'd worked as a receptionist there during undergrad uh, for pediatrics and family practice. And so once I finished my military payback, I then went back to that clinic as a physician. Wow. Yep. Uh, and uh, kind of jokingly, I say now I had my own parking spot because <laughs> physicians have assigned <laughs> parking spots and I had parked in the way back when I was a receptionist. Um, but yeah, so then it went, so as a, as a civilian, the difference practicing in a remote area, particularly a remote area so far away from any civilization Mm -hmm. uh middle of alaska i mean there's probably places like it like in you know north dakota or something like that but even north dakota you're attached to the u.s i'm not even attached to the lower 48 like Mm -hmm. we're out there um where i practice as a pediatrician we had no pediatric subspecialties available in town twice a month the cardiologist from anchorage which is about 360 miles away would fly up and do clinics for the day and knowing that i wanted to do cardiology i would take those days off and kind of just shadow him, you know, see patients with him, um, watch him do echoes, things like that. Uh, But he was really the only subspecialist that even came to Fairbanks. Otherwise, you know, neurology, endocrinology, pulmonology, any of that, um, very few in Anchorage. We had a neurologist in Anchorage. Otherwise, it's Seattle is the next closest. So in Fairbanks, Alaska, as a pediatrician, I was acting as a neonatologist, 
a, an intensivist running the pediatric ICU, um, r running or consulting in the ER when I was on call, running the nursery, and then also doing my own clinic. And there were plenty of times that I was, you know, I would have a child with uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which mm -hmm. is life threatening, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'd have the endocrinologist on the phone and saying, okay, this is what's happening here. And she's saying, do mm -hmm. this. And, and I would do it, you know, same with neurology. I'd have a child in status epilepticus where I can't stop the seizures. And I'm, he's saying, try this and try that. And um, I felt like, I feel like doing that right out of residency was. A huge gift at the time it was terrifying yeah. but it was a huge gift because here I'd put all these years of my life into learning these skills um, and then I got to hone them mm -hmm. you know and and really understand them I mean there were I was intubating neonates almost every call I put chest tubes in you know every couple months uh, in newborns you know I was it was an, a pretty interesting experience my mind keeps going back to you though as the you know in that military course that you took right oh yeah yeah and you've got the maps and the compass yeah. and it's almost like I mean there's got to be some parallels there yeah you you are you're, you're finding your way yeah with help which is which is huge too I mean yeah. I even though I was alone as the military physician I worked with great pediatricians on the civilian side so that was a relief um but even though I was alone I I always had someone to call you know and um and the the amount that you learn doing that, you know, where it's it's on you, it's my mm -hmm. license. I'm actually giving the care, but I'm, you know, getting help from the subspecialists. Um, it's tremendous. It's awesome, and it also taught me empathy for those calling for help, because, you know, it's not always that they were, these subspecialists were happy to hear from me at you know two in the morning when I had a child in status that I couldn't stop the seizures, but I, I had to call them, you know. Um, and there were plenty of times that I remember thinking, you could just be nice, you know, <laughs> depending, not everyone, a lot of them were nice. But so when I get calls, um, I mean, I'm, I don't care what time it is. I, there was a trick I was told once, smile before you answer the phone, right? As sure. a receptionist, it was smile before you answer the phone yeah. so they can hear the smile. But I do that. I physically do that. And, and if they say, I'm so sorry to bother you, it's, you're not a bother, you know, I am happy to be here for you. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll get calls from people that I am not, I'm not technically their cardiologist to call. Um, but they'll call me, A, they'll know I'll answer. Um, and I'll always try to help, regardless. Sure. Um, you know, I don't care if they call me from, I don't know, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, and most physicians have my cell number rather than having to go through the service. Because I know the difficulty of I'm here scared out of my mind with this kid who I want to help with every fiber of my soul mm -hmm. and I need help in order to do that. And I have to make four different phone calls through, you know, various channels to try to find someone that's, yeah. I just want them to be able to pick up the phone and talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to be happy when they do that. Absolutely. Um, you did your fellowship um, in Rochester. Yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. That's how I got here. I never thought I was going to be in Wisconsin, that wasn't on my radar. So, so you're you're doing you know all that incredible incredible work as a general pediatrician in Fairbanks, and then you decide to pursue that fellowship, and and you land with Mayo in Rochester. Yeah, I mean that that's a little bit of a funny story too, or a maybe not a funny story, but a, a story. Um, so when I got out of the military and I went to the civilian clinic, uh, the physician that I interviewed with was one of the coolest ladies I've ever known in my life, and I still know her. We're friends. Um, but she said to me, you want to be a cardiologist? She says, you should go now. If you want to go to fellowship, you should go now because you are going to be comfortable here. Um, you're going to make a good living, which you do in Alaska. You get paid well as a physician. Um, you're going to be making a good living. Your kids are going to be in school. Your husband's going to be at a good job. You're going to be comfortable. You're not going to want to go. And I think that she had initially intended to do neonatology. And same as me, had said, I'm going to work a few years and then go. Uh, so she was giving me that advice, saying, if you really want to do this, do it. And I, I said to her, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be a cardiologist. Don't worry. And that kind of came back to bite me a few years later as I got comfortable. And I was very happy as a pediatrician and very happy with the people I worked with. My kids were in school and doing great. My husband had a good job. It was, we had a beautiful home. My parents are in Alaska and my, my mom was my nanny. I mean, it was just like 
fairy tale land. And in the back of my mind, it was me telling Michelle, well, I'm going to go to fellowship. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I will apply. I'll only apply to great places. Uh, and I'm not going to get in because I'm this little pediatrician in Fairbanks, Alaska. What have I done? What have you done? Well, have you been listening? Well, well, most people <laughs> applying to fellowship have published. I hadn't published. My only research was genetics and undergrad. I didn't do any research in medical school or residency. Um, my residency was very clinically focused because it was the military. Mm -hmm. And their saying was, you're going to be alone on Guam. And so it was, when you're alone on Guam with this kid and there's weather, you got to keep them alive for you know 72 hours before you can get a plane in. So what are you going to do when you're alone on Guam? So there wasn't a lot of academic pursuits um, or, or pressure, I should say. There wasn't any academic pr pressure to publish or things like that, where if you want to go to fellowship, typically that's what you do. You publish because mm -hmm. you know it's just part of the whole thing. And I thought, I've not published anything. I haven't done research in years. I'm just practicing medicine in Alaska. I was chairman of my department at that point, so that was good. But... I honestly did not think that I would get in. And I applied to, oh, I think four or five schools, maybe four, interviewed at all of them. Um, two of them actually, they're not supposed to say whether you get in or not, but two of them actually called and were kind of like basically said that I was in it. And I remember at that point thinking, oh, boy, you know. And then when match day, so there's match day in medicine where mm -hmm. everybody finds out at the same time where they go and I had, I had kind of thought, well, if I get into the, a couple of the other ones that I'd applied to, I was like, eh, I, I could take it or leave it. And maybe I'll just hang out. And then I matched with Mayo, which was, of course, my number one. And I went, how can I not go to Mayo <laughs> Clinic? <laughs> how can I not? So, so we packed up the family and we, my husband quit his job and I left my, I mean, my mom was... My mom is the most amazing person on this earth, and she would be at my house in time for me to get in the shower, and she's entertaining my kids, and then she would have dinner on the table when I got home. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, and I left that, um, and I left a good-paying job, and then I, you know, residents or fellows don't make much, mm -hmm. so we blew through savings just to go to fellowship, and uh, in retrospect, it's like, that was crazy, but it, it worked out. Because really, it really got happy. you. Because it, it got me here. It's where you are here today. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't seem like somebody who's just okay just living in the comfort. You're, you're, you're ready to pursue the next. I'm working on the comfort. <laughs> I'm working hard on the comfort. I remember when I finished fellowship, I was like, okay. And maybe that'll change. I don't know. At one point, I thought maybe I'd go to law school after <laughs> my kids went away to college. But I think I, I'm just working really hard to to just be where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. Yeah. Like, my life is so good. Of course, it was in Alaska, too. <laughs> but, I, but I haven't told anyone that, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. So I don't feel like <laughs> I have anything to prove at this point. Um, you know, I teach um, students at St. Norbert's, and I love those students, and I love the experience of teaching. So I get that in my life without having to be the rigors of truly academic medicine. Um, like I said, I love the people I work with. I love the administration I work with. It's just, you know, I it's a great life. Mm -hmm. I love this community. So I don't think that there's anything big on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And that actually feels really, really good. Sure. You know, yeah. um, my husband and I love going and doing, but we also love coming back. So we camp a lot. We go out on the boat. We do lots and lots of traveling, lots and lots of traveling, little short trips. Um, but it's it's always nice just to come home. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, what are the things today that, that fill your cup? Um, you have you had told me as we were walking in here getting ready to record today, you're like, oh, I had to stop home and feed the chickens. Yeah. You've got animals <laughs> at home. Yeah. You, yeah. Anim animals, uh, kids, I think anybody who loves kids also love animals. I, I think that's pretty universal. Um, but I'm, yeah, I love animals. I can't, I can't. Uh, my husband says every dog I see is the first dog I've ever seen. <laughs> because I'm, oh, a dog. <laughs> Can I pet your dog? Um, 
Yep. So right now we have at my house in town, we have the five chickens, um, which just gives us our five eggs a day. And that's, that's great. Uh, and they're very friendly. And at my dad's place. Do they have names? They do. In fact, what's funny is my next door neighbor is the pediatric rheumatologist and his little girls named my chickens because his little girls are also animal lovers. So uh, LB is our little bantam, and that's uh, Lily's baby because his daughter is Lily, and we decided that. She named the black and white one Mint. She named the dark one Shadow, and we decided the other dark one would be Light just because it was opposite, and then the red one is Fox. And she named them. Um, she's <laughs> she's my little doppelganger. She is so awesome. I love this little kid. So, oh, that, yeah. That is wonderful. So they wonderful. do all have names. We call them by name. They get very, very, very spoiled. Yeah. Um, we also we have a uh, 25 or so chickens at my dad's place. So my parents did move out of Alaska. Now they're in Swamico, mm-hmm. which is wonderful. They're on 24 acres because my dad is very much like me. He's animals and things like that. So uh, since he's been there, we've had goats and ducks mm-hmm. and chickens and rabbits. Um, trying to think, I tried to bring home a baby cow and he wouldn't let me. <laughs> But I'll probably do it at some point. <laughs> so please yeah. take a video of that if you oh if for you sure do that for sure. Aww. <laughs> my my friend sent me a meme of a little baby cow in the back of a Subaru and and was like, "This is you." And yeah, <laughs> probably will. So if anybody out there in in podcast land has a baby cow that needs, um, I usually yeah. take the animals that need something. So for instance, um, I just brought back to the farm the two uh, baby goats that their mother had rejected them Mm -hmm. and so they were in my house in diapers and onesies because the onesies help hold the diapers up um being bottle fed and sleeping with me for the last about six weeks oh my goodness they are so awesome and they're the so i had a set i had two other singletons that i've raised that way Mm -hmm. and then this set of two yep and they are i love baby goats they are my favorite but once they grow up they got to go back to the farm because then they start chewing on everything but if you ever have the opportunity to bottle feed a baby goat. I, I don't advocate taking away from the moms, but if they if they are rejected by their moms, which yeah. happens, oh my gosh, do it. it, it it's, it's the best experience in this world. <laughs> You'll love it. The, the real question I have for you is, do you have a school of pike living in your bathtub at home? I would if I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did stock my dad's pond in Swamico, so, <laughs> but there's no pike in there. Um, we do want, they were spawning and going up the culvert sure. up from my dad's place. Yeah. And we love to go watch that. Yeah. Um, you know, anything animals. I remember, you asked me about memories in Alaska. I remember mm-hmm. as a kid in Valdez grabbing the salmon out of the water and just throwing them up on the shore, um, you know, because they're there's just clouds of fish in the water. You know, I can remember walking up streams and having the salmon hitting my feet. Sure. Um, you know, out when we, my dad and I would land somewhere and camp for the weekend. And wow, um, yeah, wow, yeah, that's probably where I got it. <laughs> so when you, thank you first, first of all, um, you know, thank you for for coming in here and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you for your service. It was my pleasure. Um, Truly, when you look at all of these experiences and you've shared a lot um, you know from you know kind of being that lone pediatrician and in, in, in Alaska um, the some of the the military training you've been through um, the the Taekwondo all of that um, how has all of that sort of fed into making you who you are today as a physician Probably more than anything else, um, it's made me, uh, it's given me incredible perseverance. So um, I've been described uh, like a dog with a bone, Mm -hmm. and I'm like that as a physician. So, and I'll give you an example. I, um, you know, if a family, sometimes I'll see patients whose loved ones have passed away suddenly, and you want to know, is this uh, cardiac or not and sometimes we just don't have the answer and I've I've called the coroner's office and I speak with the coroner and I say this is the patient I'll get the patient's name date of birth and date of death um, and then arrange you know if they didn't have say molecular bi- autopsy try work with the family and get that sent and um, you know it's just it's a lot of time and energy um, but I know that it's the family's not gonna be able to do it on their own and it makes a huge difference in the end so I have a hard time 
accepting no or can't or won't. Um, my administration may not like me for that sometimes. <laughs> you know, because I'll be told no and I'll say, but it doesn't make sense or why or, um, you know, but what about, have you thought about this? Um, I am the biggest optimist. Like, there's nothing that I that I that occur, just like with medical school he's like oh you're going to medical school well yeah I I just don't think I can't do anything um, and that I think goes back to my training my martial arts instructor in particular my dad who I mean this guy you give him duct tape and you know a, a, <laughs> a pulley and a rope and he can do anything truly um, my military training I just I feel like if there's a will or there's a way um, in any situation. Mm. And that's probably why I went ahead and went to fellowship. I, I never think that things are going to be as bad as they turn out to be, or as, I should say as difficult as they turn out to be. And I do find myself all the time in situations going, I should not have taken this on, but it works out. And you just put your head down and keep going. And that's just what I've done. I think that's what I've learned over time in all those situations is if you just take one step after another, you're going to get where you want to be. Um, and that's true treating patients. And that's true you know, training to be a particular cardiologist. It's just, it's just the way it is. It's the way I am. I don't know that there's a better way that we can wrap up this episode <laughs> than, than what you just said. Thank you so, so much. And just an awesome story. And we're super excited to get it out there. Well, thank you. This was fun. And thank you um, to our listeners as well. To learn more about Dr. Beth Woods and other pediatric specialists at Prevea Health, visit Prevea.com. And be sure to check out our many other great doctors, inspiring stories episodes right here on Plug Into Health. You've been listening to Plug Into Health with Prevea Health. To learn more and to submit ideas for future shows, please visit Prevea.com slash podcast. And please remember, the information provided in this podcast does not constitute medical advice. It is not intended to replace interactions with your healthcare professional. And if you are concerned about your healthcare, you should consult with your healthcare professional. You can learn more about Prevea Health at Prevea.com. Thank you for choosing to plug into health with Prevea Health.